You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I am also lucky enough to be mom of three really fun, awesome kids. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. I'm going to remind you throughout the show that you can call in and ask us questions directly on air. The number is 855-856-1380. I would really encourage you to take advantage and give us a call. So today we are continuing a series near and dear to my heart called Mama Docs on Call, where I'm introducing you to physicians who are also moms, just like me, and they're here to provide information and support that's really geared to you and your family. If you've missed any of the shows thus far, I would encourage you to go onto the bbmglobalnetwork.com backslash md hyphen for hyphen moms.com and check them out. So today we are going back to us. We're going to focus on our bodies today with a topic that causes a lot of anxiety. That's our breasts and breast cancer. I think there's a lot of confusion surrounding this topic and thus a lot of fear, you know, because breast cancer is, it's not uncommon as cancers go, but it's also a cancer that because it is so prevalent, we as women can take ownership of our health more than maybe some of the other illnesses that we in theory, are at risk for. So my guest today, you know, my guest today is someone I've known for a long time. She's someone I have really respected for as long as I've known her. And I'm sure you are going to love her as much as I do. Um, Frankly, we've known each other since we were newbies in the world of medicine, way before anyone called us mommy, let alone called us doctor. Um, Dr. Karen Barron is a board certified radiologist specializing in women's imaging. She received her BA in biology from Brown University, magnum cum laude, and her MD degree from New York University School of Medicine. She completed a diagnostic radiology residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell, and received her subspecialty fellowship training in breast and body imaging at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Barron practices at Murray Hill Radiology in Manhattan, a dedicated women's imaging practice focused on breast health and patient comfort. Welcome, Karen. I'm so happy you're here with me and with all of us. Hi, Carly. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm so psyched. So as I was saying, we've known each other for a really long time. So I'm, I have no doubt today's going to be awesome because I know you and I know you're great. <laughs> so maybe we can start by, you know, kind of overview. Maybe, you know, let's start for those for those who are not lucky enough to know you. We can start by you could tell us, why did you decide to go into your specialty? So in medical school, back when we were med students, I felt like a lot of the 
problem solving or the diagnoses were coming from the imaging, and I just found that very exciting. And I felt like I wanted to be part of that. It's um, it's very challenging as a radiologist. You look for abnormalities, and then you have to interpret them. Um, and then specifically, I was drawn to breast imaging because it's it's obviously focused on women's health. And I really believe that we save lives via the early detection of breast cancer, and that's just a very satisfying career for me. Now, you you happen to have relationships with your patients, correct? I mean, I think mm-hmm. when people right. sometimes so think of practice, radiologists, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Our practice is unique. Um, I mean, most breast imagers will have relationships as well because we see patients. Um, if there's an abnormality, if we need to do a biopsy, we do actually see patients. You're correct that most radiologists are sort of behind the scenes. Um, but also specifically in our practice, we see every patient um, who walks through the door. We do an exam. We meet with them. Um, we do breast ultrasounds. We talk with them. So we have very close relationships with our patients in my practice. Now, when should a woman consider seeing a breast radiologist? At what age should she start thinking about her breast health? Sure. So I think breast health is always something to be thinking about. Um, even for young women, it's just important to know what your breasts look like and what they feel like so that you can always note any abnormalities or changes. Um, but that said, in terms of screening mammography and for average risk women, the recommendation really is to start at age 40. Um, so it's not that breast cancer doesn't occur in younger women because it certainly does. Um, it's just a lot less common. So that one in eight statistic that most people are familiar with, that's a lifetime risk of breast cancer. So for a woman in her 20s, you know, the chance of her getting breast cancer the next 10 years is quite low. It's about one in, you know, almost 2,000. For a woman in her 30s, it's one in 230. But as you get into your 40s, it's already one in 69. So you can see that the 40s are sort of an increase. And that's why we do recommend starting screening mammography at age 40 for women that um, are at average risk. And for the woman who's in her 20s and 30s, should she be doing self-exams? controversial question. Um, I think a lot of societies don't quite agree on that. Um, They don't know if there's really a benefit from doing clinical breast exam. Personally, I think it's always a good idea to be aware of your breast because then how else are you going to notice any changes? Especially for women in their 20s and 30s that aren't undergoing screening, it's even more important because there's no other way to find the cancer, God forbid, should one occur. You know, we've certainly had patients um, in their 30s in our practice who weren't yet being screened who presented with lumps that turned out to be cancer. Um, so I don't want to scare people because the vast majority are not going to be cancer, but it's still a good idea to know your breasts. And if a woman happens to feel a lump, what could it be if not cancer? There's lots of things that happen in the breast, lots of benign diseases or, you know, entities in the breast that are not cancerous. Um, certainly cysts are the most common thing that are going to, is going to present as a lump. Um, cysts are very common, particularly in young women. Um, other than cysts, there's benign masses. There's fibroadenomas is a very common mass. Um, there's other types of masses, but really the only way to tell is going to be with an imaging workup and possibly a biopsy. And for a woman who, you know, you said a woman who is low risk, how does the woman know if she's actually not low risk? Like what, what defines low risk versus higher risk? Sure. So, I, well, I said average risk. So average risk is the is the term. So there isn't really any low risk. But for high risk women, it really is going to depend on your family history. Um, specifically, the BRCA mutation is probably the highest risk. The BRCA one and two mutations um, those confer the highest uh, risk for breast cancer. And those are, you know, if you have breast cancer in your family, somebody would have been tested for that, then you might be aware of that. Um, it's not a very common gene, but Specifically in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, I think it's about one in 40 um, have the gene. So it's not that uncommon in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Um, but really, it's going to come down to family history or, you know, other l- rarer things, other kinds of syndromes that people can have, um, you know, chest irradiation for treatment for cancer, things like that. But I think um, for most people, it's going to be their family history. And if a woman has a first-degree relative who has had breast cancer, what is a current recommendation for when she should then start having mammograms? It's really going to depend on the risk 
profile, and I think it's a good conversation to have um, with your doctor if a woman thinks that she might be at higher risk for breast cancer. There's different models that will determine your lifetime risk and then sort of what screening you should have. So I can't say off the bat just based on that information, but it's going to it's going to be an involved conversation. There's lots of risk factors for breast cancer and different ways of calculating risk and. It's, it's quite complex, actually, so it's really a discussion to have with your doctor who might even refer you to a genetic counselor for further evaluation. So it's not the same as, like, you know, the whole screening colonoscopy, start 10 years younger than whenever so-and-so had colon cancer concept? Well, there are similarities. Um, certainly, yes, yeah, 10 years younger is the recommended to, to start screening um, before if you, have a, if you have a relative that's affected, but I think the risk is just calculated in a, a very complex way, and that's why I sort of said defer to um, to your physician who can calculate that for you. And how does breastfeeding affect all of this? Um, breastfeeding probably is um, a little bit protective. It's not, you know, a huge factor. It certainly shouldn't drive someone to breastfeed or not to breastfeed. But it seems that it's probably a little bit protective. It might be because, um, you know, during breastfeeding, most women don't have their cycles. And unless you're exposed to your cycles, the theory is that it might decrease your risk of breast cancer. But it's not a huge risk factor one way or the other. Oh, so that's really interesting. So it's so it's estrogen dependent. Uh, in theory, is it meaning, so if a woman um, nurses, I mean, what is it dependent right. upon? So the, the theory is that it, it's sort of like prolonged exposure to hormones. Um, so the breastfeeding could be a little bit protective. You know, parity, so the number of children or pregnancies a woman has is protective. So um, if a woman has is does not have any children or has children later in life, which, you know, is defined as after 30 in the studies, um, <laughs> then Don't you love that? increased risk. <laughs> or, um, you know, starting to menstruate before age 12 or a later menopause after age 55, basically prolonged exposure to hormones is the theme um, for increased risk of breast cancer. Now, how do, if at all, do synthetic hormones modify the risk? Yes. So supposedly um, oral contraceptives slightly increase the risk. Um, and then hormone postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy um, all will also increase the risk of breast cancer. Right. So being on the pill is not protective, despite the fact that in theory, depending on the pill, you, it could suppress your own cycle. But it right. So it sounds I'm like really it's confusing. With the mechanism. Yeah, I'm, I don't really know what the mechanism is, and I don't know that anybody does. All I, you know, I've read that they, it's a slightly higher risk, but. Again, these are very small risks. The major risks are going to be, you know, the genetics. Um, being a woman, age is actually one of the biggest risk factors because it increases with age. Um, you know, the genetics, the family history, personal history of breast cancer, breast density is one that we can talk about, and then, you know, history of other biopsies. And, and the, these are all sort of very small contributors. Right, and I think, as you said, I think being a woman is probably yeah, our greatest risk, right? Risk <laughs> For bre yeah, although men do get breast cancer as well. They certainly do. It's just much more rare, as I'm sure you know. Right. Um, have, has there been an increase, it just occurred to me to ask this, but has there been an increase over time in the number of women who are being diagnosed with breast cancer, or is it a stable? Um, yeah. No, actually, it's about 1% per year increase in incidence for uh, for the last several decades. I think actually more than decades, maybe. I don't want to miss say anything, but it's been a long time that it's been actually rising at a rate of about 1% per year. Are there theories for why? Is it environmental or is there better detection? It can't be detection because that wouldn't make sense necessarily. Right. So. It's not it's not detection, um, but it, it I'm sure there's tons of theories about why, but none that are credible at this point. Well, hopefully, hopefully detection is improving, which it you know early detection and then treatment. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I think breast cancer awareness has clearly improved. You know, all of this obviously also leads to a lot of fear for a lot of women. We have to take a brief break on the, right as I say the word fear, but 
We're going to increase hope in a moment, too. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we're talking about breast health with radiologist Dr. Karen Barron. And when we return, we're going to talk about self-exam some more and whether you should do it. And we're also going to find out more about this notion of early detection. So stay with us. Hello, everybody. This is Coach Betty Louise, and I have a question for you. When is the last time you looked in the mirror and saw your amazing beauty and sexuality? 80% of women do not have a positive body image. 97% of women do not like something about their bodies, and over 10 million women have eating disorders. In addition, at least 40% of women are sexually repressed and one in seven marriages are sexless. I've just completed a book called Healing with Pleasure Medicine. What I will teach you is what gets in the way of your ability to see your beauty, sensuality, and sexuality. How to shift your perception to increase pleasure throughout your entire day. Okay, the place to find all of this information is CoachBettyLive.com. One more time, CoachBettyLive.com. Look forward to connecting. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today my guest is breast radiologist, Dr. Karen Barron. And don't forget, you can call in and ask us anything directly to Karen or myself because our phone lines are open, 855-856-1380. So very quickly, before the break, I said self-exams. We're going to talk about it for one more moment. So the in the break, we were just briefly talking about it together. So the, the data just doesn't support there being some great benefit, correct? I think it's a controversial area. <laughs> so do it if you want to, but if you don't do it, don't feel too badly. Is that a fair statement? I think that's fair. And I would also just, um, I would still have yearly clinical exams by your doctor for sure, by your um, either internist or OBGYN. Yes, and you should do that anyway. Um, now, what about the whole notion of having dense breasts? I mean, I, I remember being told that I had dense breasts, and I was like, great, thanks. Same to you. Like, I have no idea what that means. It doesn't sound very good. You know, anything, the word dense just, it just is not very nice. Um, what does that mean? Right. So dense breasts have become, or breast density has become like a, a hot topic in our world. Um, what it means basically to have dense breasts, so to understand that you just have to know what the breasts are made up of. And so the breast tissue is composed of the milk glands and milk ducts, which obviously produce the milk and the connective tissue supporting those structures. And the other component is fat. So basically it's the relative um, proportions of fat and glandular tissue that will either make your breast dense or not dense. And it's really something that's determined on a mammogram, so it's not something that can be determined on a physical exam. Um, and on mammograms, there's just um, it's a four-point scale, basically, a way of grading the breast density. And the reason this has become so important is that um, the evidence has shown that having dense breasts increases one's risk of getting breast cancer. And there's two reasons for that. Um, one is that having dense breasts really does make the mammogram just not as good. Um, so you go from very high sensitivity for detecting breast cancer to like quite low, about even as low as 50%. 
So the mammogram is really just not as good in dense breasted women. And the other thing is that it's an independent risk factor. So regardless of the fact that it's harder to find it, it actually does occur more frequently in women with dense breasts. Um, and there's, like I said, different grades of density, but the most, at the most extreme, extremely dense breasts, you're, the a woman is four to six more times likely to get breast cancer as a woman with totally fatty breasts. So it is a significant risk factor. Um, and again, it, it's, it's problematic because the mammogram is just not as good in dense breasted women. And then the question was, well, what can we do to make detection better in dense breasted women? And the answer so far seems to be um, supplementary testing, and that really consists of ultrasound or breast MRI. And in terms of the ultrasound, it's like an ultrasound anywhere else of your body. You know, the technologist or the doctor will put some gel in the breast and scan it. It has no radiation. It's, it's relatively quick. Um, and we found that ultrasound added to mammography will find an extra few cancers that mammography would miss. So about three to four cancers in a thousand patients. So it's not a terrible amount, um, but still, it's a sort of a quick and easy way to to screen the breasts. And then the other way is breast MRI, um, but this is very much reserved for women that are very high risk, which the American Cancer Society defines as a lifetime risk greater than 20 or 25 percent. And again, that goes back to calculating one's individual risk with those different risk models. Um, but certainly, somebody with like the BRCA gene would qualify for a breast MRI. Um, or bad family history, um, things like that. So again, breast MRI really reserved for the very high risk patients, but ultrasound can be obtained um, usually just as a supplement for dense breast uh, women screening. Now, if a woman has implants, does that in any way modify how effective any of these screening tests are? Well, so implants in and of themselves don't cause an increased risk of cancer with the exception of the extremely rare type of um, lymphoma that we wanted to talk about. Um, but it, it does limit the mammogram somewhat. It does decrease the sensitivity of the mammogram. Women with implants do get, we do extra pictures where we push the implant out of the way and we do the breast tissue with and without the implant. And that's just to get a better view. Um, so the bottom line is, you know, we certainly do extra to detect cancer in these women. And in our practice, we also do add ultrasound if there's, um, usually if, if the breast is anything except for fatty, we will add ultrasound just to feel like we're getting another view, another shot at looking for something. And does it make a difference if it's above or under the muscle? It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't so much make a difference. It is easier to push out of the way if it's under the muscle. But... Okay. Now, is is are you know? I think women are inherently you know the notion of a mammogram. I think there was maybe. Maybe it was Sex in the City. I can't remember exactly which show, but, you know, there was this, I think it was Sex in the City, where they talked about how uncomfortable a mammogram is, you know, like that basically you become your breast becomes a pancake. Is that a yeah. fair, is that a fair interpretation of a mammogram? I think it is uncomfortable for most women, but it should not be painful. I mean, it is uncomfortable. But it's a few seconds. You know, a few seconds out of your year, I think, is, is mostly tolerable. I agree it's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but, again, it lasts a few seconds for each picture. It's generally just four pictures, and it's one time a year. And, you know, the upside is the life saved, so I think it's worth it. <laughs> and are there any signs or symptoms that a woman can look for if she – that would indicate cancer – beyond, you know, having felt a lump um, that might, you know, su that would suggest that she should go to her internist, to her OB, and, and, you know, say, I need to go see a breast radiologist? Sure. I mean, the most common presenting sign of, you know, would be a lump, um, especially if it's a hard, you know, firm lump. That's a warning sign. Um, other things to look out for would be a change in the size or shape of the breast um, or any changes in the nipple. Um, any dimpling of the skin, um, change in color, like focal change in color of the skin if it becomes a little bit red or darker, and nipple discharge. Those are all um, concerning symptoms that would have to be worked up. And when you say nipple discharge, I, I, on the show we've talked a lot over different weeks about how, you know, women who have breastfed in the past can, you know, essentially have, can end up breast, you know, having lactate, can lactate again for years 
without it necessarily having indicating any issue. What kind of discharge are we talking about in, that's actually concerning? Sure. So the most concerning would be um, unilateral, so obviously only involving one breast, like the, what you're describing, you know, sort of lactational that would presumably involve both breasts, but I'm, I don't know. Um, so coming out of one breast and spontaneous. So some, a lot of women can elicit some sort of discharge if you squeeze the nipple, um, but we're talking about spontaneous, meaning you just notice it on your bra or on your clothing. Um, bloody nipple discharge would certainly have to be um, worked up. That would be the most concerning. And how about pain? Is that common? So breast pain is almost universally experienced is my, is my take. I mean, most women have breast pain at some point in time. Um, it's often cyclical and varies with the menstrual cycle. Again, if it's involving both breasts, um, it's not as concerning as if it only involved one specific spot in one breast. I mean, that would certainly need to be worked up. Um, if you Certainly, if you have any breast pain, I would definitely speak with your doctor because it may or may not need to be worked up, and there's also things that we can do um, to help alleviate pain. So I think that would definitely be something to discuss with your doctor. And most of the women who come and see you who are being, you know, who are being evaluated rule out a concern for cancer. Do they feel well? I mean, do they come in and say, you know, I otherwise feel okay? Or are they complaining about feeling sick in some way? I think the breast cancer would have to be very, very advanced for a woman to feel sick. I mean, I've seen metastatic breast cancer women that look fine, so it's kind of scary. Right. Well, that's my point. So most women, you know, because I think women have this vision of, well, I feel well, so I, I must not be sick. But in reality, you actually can feel perfectly fine and have a tumor that's growing that you're unaware of, it, you know, so you, well, you can't well, ignore would, it would necessarily. Call. I would qualify that because they may feel fine, but they don't look fine. Their breast does not look normal. There's, they might be in denial about the way their breast looks. But if you, if one has an advanced breast cancer, it's, it's, you can see it. I mean, if it's really that advanced. So I'll qualify that by saying that a lot of women just kind of in denial. If, if when they come in with advanced um, breast cancers, unfortunately. And once, uh, once someone has had breast cancer, how often do they then have to see you, at, like for follow up? once they've been treated? You know, actually the recommendations are not any different. It's still yearly. So some surgeons um, will send them back for uh, a few six month follow-ups perhaps, but it's generally still yearly. Um, really? Mm -hmm. That's actually surprising. Even in the setting of like, I mean, more aggressive cancers? Huh, that's pretty, that's, that's I mean, we can talk about supplemental screening, certainly ultrasound or MRI, but there's, there's few indications to do mammography more than once a year. In fact, I can't and really that, think of any. <laughs> and that includes as you get older. It doesn't change. I mean, it doesn't change. The only time a woman would be getting more than yearly is if um, we saw something that was questionable and, and, you know, we want to do a short term follow up. That certainly happens a lot, in which case a woman would come back at six month intervals, um, really just one extra time. Um, and that happens not infrequently if we feel like something is benign, but we, you know, it's not on the threshold to biopsy, but we just want to follow it a little more closely than a six month is totally appropriate. Um, but in terms of general screening, it's still yearly. And just to confirm, so breast cancer risk continues as we age, right? This is not something where, you know, there are a lot of things where once you hit menopause, you're past menopause, like your risk then somewhat either equalizer or goes down. Breast cancer, do you, do you continue to have ongoing risk, C correct? Correct, correct. Does it ever go down? Do we ever get a pass? Um, I think at some point the graph may be in the 80s or 90s um, plateaus. I'm not sure, but it's certainly, you know, way up and definitely through your 80s, it, it will continue. And if you have a family member who had breast cancer in her 80s, does that actually qualify as, as increasing your risk for breast cancer? Um, certainly a lot less, though, than if you had a relative with a premenopausal breast cancer. Um, you know, it's not nothing, but it probably doesn't contribute substantially as opposed to someone who has a relative, first degree relative with a premenopausal breast cancer. I ask because my grandmother had breast cancer very benign, you know, it was not a big deal, but she was uh, in her 80s. Um, thankfully, she's fine, but 
it's always good to know. Um, yeah, she's she's almost 90 and going strong. She's probably in better health than any of us. Woman does Zumba like four days a week. She's a rock star, I'm telling you. She's got a better social life than anyone I know. If she's listening, go you, Grandma. Um, anyway, she's really incredible. Now, I think, you know, breast cancer is something that, you know, there's a lot of social awareness around. Um, do you think that that has helped improve early detection? Or do you think the fear surrounding breast cancer has let, meant that people still are really hesitant to come in? It's a hard question to answer because I only see the people that come in. So I don't see the people that don't come in. Um, once in a blue moon, I will have someone who comes in with a, with a breast cancer that they felt because they weren't being screened. But the vast majority of our patients are coming in and being screened. So I don't see the other side of it. Hopefully there isn't much of another side, right? We have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are talking about breast health. And when we come back, we're going to talk about if there are ways to reduce the risk of breast cancer and what to expect next if you're told that you have a lump. What are the steps to, to, that you're going to go down? Stay with us. Horses, mystical, present, past, and future, all in one. Wild, free, domestic, and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted. And every 10 minutes, a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope. There is help. There is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing. And it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be. Healed. Hopeful. Happy. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and today my guest is Dr. Karen Barron. If you have a question, you should give us a call, 855-856-1380. So, you know, I think a lot of us are wondering, is there anything we can do to reduce the risk of breast cancer? Well, in terms of, like I said, the, you know, ma the major risk factors, including your genetics and your family history and your age, there's nothing you can do, right? You can't change that. You can't change when you got your period or when you went through menopause. Um, the, the things that are lifestyle related that you can try to modify, which, again, I don't know how much of a risk reduction you're going to be able to achieve, but, you know, alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption has been linked to breast cancer, so there's a slightly increased risk in those that drink um, more than one drink per day. Um, being overweight or especially obese will increase one's risk of having breast cancer, so maintaining a healthy body weight is certainly always advisable in general and then with respect to breast cancer as well. Um, getting, you know, being active, exercise. The American Cancer Society recommends, you know, a certain level of exercise, you know, for breast cancer prevention, but also, again, just for a general state of health. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not much else 
um, that's proven to be a risk factor that we can modify. Which is so, you know, frustrating, I imagine, for most of us, because we like to be able to control things, right? It's like, if we know we could do something, it just feels better. Um, Absolutely. But again, it's important not to, you know, conflate one's risk of getting breast cancer. A lot of women are very scared that, of their risk. And again, even that one in eight lifetime risk, seven out of eight women will never get breast cancer. So it's important not to be too fearful of a disease that, you know, is like more likely to not affect you personally. But at the same time, obviously, being aware of it and going for yearly screening, I mean, that's really I think yearly screening is actually, it's not going to change your risk profile, but it will certainly find something, hopefully find something at its earliest stages and give you the best options. Now, let's say that happens, right? You are that woman who goes in, your OB or, you know, internist says, listen, um, I found this lump. It wasn't here a year ago. What can a woman expect next? What are the steps that she's likely to go through? So um, her OB or her internist will refer her to an imaging facility, somewhere where she can go get worked up with imaging. Um, she'll, you know, when you walk in, you fill out a questionnaire, and it will specifically ask, uh, very importantly, if you're having any breast signs or symptoms, and if you felt a lump, or if someone else has. So it's important to also know where your doctor has felt it, although usually that's on the prescription if you have one with you. Um, at our practice, we see the patient. So one of us, one of uh, me or my colleagues, would see the patient and examine them. Um, and to try to assess um, the lump for ourselves as well as we put a marker on the breast before we do a mammogram, and that's just to um, draw attention to the area of concern when we're interpreting the mammogram. Um, and this applies to women who are going to presumably get a mammogram if they're over the age of 30 or whatever cutoff um, the center is using. So if a very young woman will probably not get a mammogram. We might start with an ultrasound. Um, but usually if we start with a mammogram, that's what happens, and then may or may not need additional imaging with an ultrasound as well. And then let's say, um, you know, a lump is confirmed. What, um, diagnostically speaking, what options are there? How, what's the most common form in terms of diagnosis? What do you do? Well, so it depends what we see. So if we see, um, like if we do an ultrasound and we see that it's just a cyst and that the cyst is what's causing the patient or the doctor to feel the lump, then the patient is done because that's a benign finding. It's a cyst. We can take the fluid out if the patient wants, but we can also just leave it in. It's fine. Um, and the patient will go home happy knowing that it's just a cyst that's causing her lump. Uh, if it's not a cyst, if it's a solid mass, that would generally um, oftentimes require a biopsy. And it sounds scary, but it's actually a really minimally invasive uh, process or procedure rather. Um, it just, it's done under a local anesthesia, just similar to like a dental filling. You know, we deck a little bit of lidocaine, put a, a needle inside, take some tissue out, send it to pathology, and we get a result. So it's actually very well tolerated. Um, there are very few contraindications. It's an in-office procedure. Um, it takes about 20 minutes total. Um, it's actually quite easy, and we do it a lot. So that's usually how we would make a diagnosis with a biopsy like that. And then depending on the results, either you're – you're fine, or a woman has to then move into more subspecialized oncology, correct? Like a breast surgeon, an oncologist, et cetera, depending on the situation. Sure. I mean, if we find something that, you know, if we find cancer or something else that's not considered high risk, then we would refer the patient to a breast surgeon and, and she would take it from there. And most of the time, are breast cancers primary tumors, meaning they originate in the breast? Um, absolutely. And metastases are very rare. Um, but breast cancer does metastasize itself elsewhere, right? Correct. I always, yeah. Now, tell me, 3D mammography, what is mm -hmm. that? What is it? What are your thoughts on it? Should women be asking for it? So 3D mammography is also known as tomosynthesis. And instead of having a 2D image, the so mammogram is, a, is a, a 2D image. But 3D means that we, the machine, it images slices throughout the breast. If you kind of imagine like an apple being sliced at different parts, that's what you know, 3D mammography is, and then we can look through the breast, so to speak, 
Um, and we can see when structures are overlapping, it sort of gives us a better view. Um, and it's become more widespread. Not everyone has 3D or, you know, to some of synthesis, not every center has it, but, you know, a fair amount of centers throughout the United States have it. It's used, um, it's used for screening now. We use it in our practice. And, you know, it's just it's a better mammogram. It finds an extra few cancers that the regular mammogram um, doesn't find. And another great thing about 3D mammography is that it actually decreases the need for additional pictures. So a woman is less likely to have to need extra pictures after the original four pictures are taken if she has a 3D mammogram. And is it covered by ins most insurances? That varies a lot. Um, our, that varies a lot by, by insurance carrier, by state, et cetera. So a woman has to be careful in asking for it. She may want to call her insurance company first um, because I imagine if it's not covered by insurance, it's pricey. Well, most centers will usually charge an extra nominal fee and say that up front and say, if it's not covered by your insurance, then you agree to pay this extra fee. Um, but I agree with you. It's always a good idea to check it out. And, I mean, is there a reason not to get it? Um, the drawbacks of digital breast tomosynthesis um, it is it depends on the type that's being done. Some types do have a slightly increased radiation dose, but it's still well below the level of acceptable. But if you're asking me, you know, to be completely honest, and some of them do have a little bit of extra radiation, but again, it's it's not all centers. It's only some types of equipment that has that, and again, it's far below what is far below this threshold of, of safety. So it's not something that I think should prevent anybody from doing it. So I mean, my question more like, is there a reason that anyone, you know, like shouldn't, given that it sounds like it's a better diagnostic tool, shouldn't everyone just ask for it? Well, we, like in my practice, we give it to everybody. It's like a, you know, it's like the, it's the new regular mammogram in a lot of places. Oh, okay. That's, um, and, but you still also do ultrasound. So ultrasound will still find cancers. Yeah, ultrasound will still find cancers that 3D mammography misses because 3D mammography still suffers from the same limitations that 2D mammography has, which is you can't distinguish as well in, in breast, in dense breast tissue cancers from, from the background. So, uh, you know, it's not the, the answer to everything. It's certainly better than the regular mammogram. But ultrasound, just being a completely different modality, will still find an extra few cancers that the um, 3D mammogram would miss. Now, totally changing gears, you know, because it's such a, um, a because, you know, breast cancer is uh, one that, you know, there is a big walk every year. There, you know, there's a lot of information out there about, about breast cancer, about breast imaging, all of this are, you know, there's, I think, inherently a lot of misinformation about imaging, I'm sure. And there must be a lot of, um, th there must be something that you hear a lot that you just disagree with. What, do you have any pet peeves or anything that you would like to kind of clarify or clear up for people? Well, it's not so much a pet peeve. I just think that there's been so much controversy over their screening mammography. Um, and I think a lot of people are understandably, a lot of women are understandably confused about when to start screening and how often to do screening. Um, and I think that all this controversy has really done a huge disservice to women because the bottom line is that almost all the studies support the fact that screening mammography saves lives and there's a mortality reduction. Um, the quibbling is sort of about the risks and the benefits of, of that, but everyone can agree that screening mammography starting at age 40 will save and continued annually will save the most lives. So if that's all you're interested in, in saving women's lives, then you know, every year at age 40 is the recommendation, and that's why the American College of Radiology and Society of Breast Imaging, those, we support those, that recommendation. Um, other recommendations that call for starting screening later or by, you know, biannually, they do, re they absolutely will reduce um, the false positives and the other risk, which is, you know, the quote, anxiety. But again, that's very much a judgment call that I think women should make for themselves. You know, if you would rather not undergo anxiety, 
then perhaps don't have a mammogram starting age 40. But I think most women, given the option, would rather, you know, have their lives potentially saved and experience some of that anxiety. And I also think that there are strategies to reduce anxiety, um, particularly at our practice where we give the results to the woman the same day that she has her mammogram. I think that's a great way to reduce anxiety. You know, you come in and an hour later, you're leaving with a with a result, and almost always it's a clean bill of you know breast health. So I think that that's a great way to reduce anxiety. I think a lot of, there is inherent anxiety when you go and you have a mammogram and you have to wait two weeks to get a letter in the mail that says you need more pictures, and you have to go back and have more pictures. I think there is certainly anxiety with that. If you go somewhere that if you can find some place that does it same day, I think that's very helpful. And I, again, I think with the 3D, I think there is less need for additional pictures, and that reduces all causes. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, look, a little anxiety, most of us hopefully can handle that. And if you can't, maybe go talk to someone um, and work on managing it. We are going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are talking about breast health with breast radiologist, Dr. Karen Barron. After the break, Dr. Barron is going to tell us her top thing she wants us all to walk away with from today. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca. 819-360-3266. Now is your time. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and today my guest is breast radiologist, Dr. Karen Barron. And today, so we've been talking about breast health. And, you know, before we get to Dr. Barron's, like, top three things for us to know, I wanted to also ask, let's talk about deodorant for a minute because, you know, there was there has been controversy about whether or not standard deodorant with, I think the concern was titanium dioxide, although Karen, you can correct me on that one, whether there is any risk for cancer related to use of standard deodorant. What's your thoughts on this? So the, I looked on the American Cancer Society website to get this answer because I was, you know, I I wasn't aware of any evidence to support it. And indeed they state that um, antiperspirant has not been proven to be any causative agent in breast cancer. So I think, you know, if we want to believe the American Cancer Society, which we should, um, antiperspirant, um, they say, does not cause breast cancer. And they had a list of a few other things that perhaps were mentioned at one time to be associated with breast cancer, such as um, different types of bras. They say, you know, do not cause breast cancer. And that makes sense. I mean, I can't imagine the mechanism for that. So. There's um, actually a really good list on their website about things that do and don't cause breast cancer, so you guys can check that out. 
what out of curiosity, what are they saying does cause breast cancer beyond what we've talked about? Can't imagine. Yeah, just every, I mean, everything that we've talked about. Um, and then in terms of um, diet and vitamins, people are always asking me, they list that under unclear effects on breast cancer. So really the research is just, um, it's not there yet or it's sort of in progress, but we don't have results yet in terms of diet and vitamins and environmental toxins. Those are all what they classify as unclear. Whether they would be preventative, that vitamins would be preventative or be causative? Basically an unclear effect on breast cancer. Huh, okay. Yeah, I would. I would have to imagine. I, I can't imagine the mechanism, but you know, um, I also would have to imagine it would depend upon the type of breast cancer we're talking about, right? In terms of sure, uh, receptor mm-hmm. positive or negative, and what kind of what we're talking about in terms of what vitamin or is it a supplement, whatever. Um, <laughs> now, I will say as a plug for. Some, you know, I use a natural deodorant that I, not because of a concern about breast cancer, but because I actually think it's awesome. Um, it's called Fat in the Moon, and they're really, it's a really cute little company out of San Francisco, and they're great. You can find it on Etsy, um, and it's just a really nice little company, and I think it works a lot better than all the conventional deodorants that, I don't know, I like them more. On the other hand, it is a little sticky, so you got to pick your battles. Anyway, um, you know, I also think it's important for women to remember that they can, in the same, um, in the sense of picking your battles, you can only do so much and you should just take care of yourself in general, right? You can, you should just always eat well. You should always try to exercise. You should always try to sleep well, do all of these things. And that is because we are all at risk, whether you ate the right thing, you ate the wrong thing, whether you exercise enough or not, none of this really matters at the end of the day, right? We are all at risk. And unfortunately, that means we should also all remember that it, you know, we need to look around and support one another, right? We all have to Absolutely. be there for one another. And, you know, because there is a real risk and even if it's not us who is going to, have breast cancer, you know, there is a definite likelihood that someone we know will have breast cancer in her lifetime. So, you know, if nothing else, you know, if there is a breast cancer walk in your neighborhood, why not do it, right? Why not support the cause? Frankly, you know, it's a good cause to to go out and and get some exercise and, and support financially if you are so inclined. So, Karen, we were talking before the break that there are three things you would love people to come away from with today. What would they be, those three things? Sure. Well, before I go into the three things, I just wanted to say that, you know, if and this could even be one of the three things, if you're worried about something in your breast, um, see your doctor. Don't let fear hold you back. Um, the, you know, the majority of the time, these things that you are worried about are going to turn out to be nothing. But even if it is something, you definitely want to catch it early. You know, so many women are, you know, let fear and denial play in and then unfortunately end up with a worse outcome. And if they would have come earlier, they could have had a better outcome. So I would really encourage anyone who has any questions or concerns about their breast to check in with their doctor or directly with their radiologist and voice those concerns and and we can address them. Um, And that goes for everything that I've said today. If you have any questions or if you're wondering about anything, then I think, again, seeing your doctor is the best thing because I can, you know, say what I say, but I don't know every individual patient out there, of course. Um, But then in terms of what I think are the most important things, I mean, screening mammography, again, I'll just put in um, my little pitch for screening mammography. It saves lives. You know, 40,000 women die of breast cancer every year, um, and it would be more without screening mammography. So every year, starting at age 40, if you don't have any symptoms, go get your mammogram. If you do have symptoms, see your doctor, and they'll probably send you for mammograms sooner than that. Um, and then consider finding a practice that will give you same-day results. I don't know where um, what these practices are like outside of New York. They certainly exist in New York City, um, and they've got to be elsewhere. So if you are able to go somewhere where you can get same-day results, I think that that's um, a great way to sort of lessen the anxiety associated with screening. 
And then finally, if your breasts are dense, then consider getting extra screening, um, usually with ultrasound or with MRI if you're high enough risk. So that's something to talk about with your doctor or your radiologist. And of course, I want to remind everyone that today's show, while jam-packed with medical information, is not meant to supplement for direct information from your personal doctor. Um, you need to see your doctor, talk to your doctor about your own personal care because each one of you is unique and deserves personal attention. Um, and everyone, as everyone deserves personal attention, um, the information we're sharing today is general and not specific to any one person. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Karen Barron, for sharing so much with us today. Now, how can people find out more about all, all of what we were talking about. Is there any website that you would recommend people look at? I guess the American Cancer Society, is that one? That's a good one to start. Um, the Susan uh, G. Coleman Breast Cancer Foundation has a lot of great information, um, specifically for dense breast, dense breast information. Um, there's densebreastinfo.org is a good one. Um, I think those three are probably a good bet. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. Also, tune in again next week and every Wednesday at 1 p.m. on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio or anytime on the BBMGlobalNetwork.com. Next week, we're continuing with our Mama Docs on call with a physician who focuses on blood disorders and cancers. And she'll explain more about how to protect ourselves against these diseases and remain healthy. I look forward to hearing from you with your questions and thoughts. You can always email me at cs at carlysidermd.com and I'll happily answer your questions on the air. And you can also find me anytime on my website, www.carlysidermd.com. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.